Please stand by. We'll be streaming live soon. Hello, shalom. This is Betty McKinney in the footsteps of Jesus. And today we are in the city of David. Actually, behind me is an artist's rendition of what the city of David might have looked like. And by the way, if some of you have been to Israel with me, this looks familiar, right? This, is, this uh, pull-on is part of my Israel garb that I always use when I'm doing a tour in Israel. I'm so short, I've got to have something that will sort of colorful, that will catch people's <laughs> eyes so they can find me in the crowd. All right, so again, behind me is an artist's rendition of what the city of David probably looked like. It was an ancient Jebusite or Canaanite fortress, and it became the original, the oldest part of Jerusalem. In 1000 BC, David took this stronghold, the stronghold of the Jebusites, for the capital of Israel. He went in through the water structure the water tunnels and he captured the city from inside not a siege from the outside why did David choose this place to bring the 12 tribes together into one nation to make a capital to be established as the first king of Israel why did David choose this place well first of all it was already a strong fortress which made it defensible if you look if you can see how this, this fortress rises up between two valleys, right directly behind me is the deep, deep Kidron Valley. Then over here, whoops, wrong side, over here <laughs> to the bottom is the Gehenna Valley, which came to be known for the word for hell because it's where they burned all their garbage. And there was always fires going down in the Gehenna Valley. Then over on the other side of the city of David was the Tyrophian Valley that goes up through the middle. And boy, I could tell you all kinds of cool things about this valley, how God placed his handprint on the topography of Jerusalem through these valleys. Um, but obviously the Holy Spirit of God led David to this spot to establish his capital. The second thing that made this the place that God led David to, to take as the capital was that it had water supply. As in anywhere else, in Israel, water is life. And in the location of Jerusalem, up in the mountains, you didn't have rivers and lakes flowing everywhere. <laughs> but what this city had was the Gihon Spring. Gihon means gusher. And it literally was just a gushing spring of crystal clear water. And if you are going to survive as a city, you have to have lots of water. So there was the Gihon Spring. It was an abundant source of water. So that is why the Canaanites built their fortress there in the first place. So as you look at this artist's rendition, this is what the original Jerusalem looked like. If you read Isaiah, Jeremiah, the Nehemiah, um, which we're going to show you later, one of the walls that Nehemiah helped construct on the west side or the Kidron Valley side of the city of, of David, and you read those prophets, this is what Jerusalem looked like in their day. If you've been to, to Jerusalem and you've seen those big city walls that surround, the old, it's called the old city of Jerusalem, but those walls were built in 1538 by the Turks. So in terms of biblical history, those are relatively new, 1538. <laughs> and those were the walls in which Jesus walked. But if we look at the Old Testament, and we look at David's time, this is the original Jerusalem. Here is where David built his palace in the stronghold of Zion. As this city of David slopes up toward the hill, when you get to the top, that is called Mount Zion. And David established his city at Mount Zion. So imagine, these are the streets where the prophets walked. This is the... the configuration of Jerusalem during the first temple era when Solomon built the temple up at the top, the top where the threshing floor was, that's where the temple was built by Solomon. And we can see homes there that, were, that date back to the Babylonian invasion of 587 BC. <coughs> so um, 
let, there is just, let's go to the next slide where we're going to see if we visit the city of David today, if we look at the Canaanite... kind of get in your mind, this is the location that David was when God made covenant with him, and as that covenant was executed. And I'm going to read a lot of scripture today, so I hope you'll just take your Bible, and I'm going to be turning from one scripture to another, and um, I hope you'll just follow with me and really look at the words on the page, okay? So we're going to start in 2 Samuel chapter 7, <coughs> verse 8. I'm going to take a little drink here. We're just going to take our time and not be rushed. 2 Samuel 7, 8. Whoops, see, I'm in 1 Samuel. <laughs> <laughs> now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on the earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. Nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly. Even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. <clears throat> so as we read God's covenant here with David, I see five major points. In verse 12, he says, Your son will secede you on the throne. Then in verse 13, He shall build a house for my name. 
So Solomon, rather than David, would build the temple. That's point number two. Point number three is also in verse 13. Solomon's throne would be established forever. Verse 4, very, very important to this study, is in 14. Not verse 4, but point 4. In verse 14, if he sinned, there would be appropriate punishment by rods of men, but God's mercy and loyal love would endure to him forever. You see that in 14? When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rods of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But then in verse 16 is number 5. David's house, kingdom, and throne would be established forever. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Do you believe that this covenant that God made is true and everlasting? God had said to David, David, this is my covenant with you. When you die, I will not take away the throne from your family lineage. God had taken away the throne from Saul. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. It did not go to Saul's son, Jonathan. The throne passed to David of the tribe of Judah. And God is saying here to David, when your people sin, I will punish them. They will even go into captivity. There will be long periods of time when no son of yours sits upon the throne of Israel. There will be long periods of time when you are ruled by your enemies. But in the end, ultimately, a descendant of David of the tribe of Judah, the offspring of David, the son of David, will rule <coughs> as king of Israel and king of kings. And that throne will never be taken from him. What does that mean? That throne will never be taken from him. Isaiah 9, 7. I'm going to be turning to these in my Bible, and I'm just... No, we're not going to rush, so I hope you'll go ahead and turn to them in your Bible and see these words on the page for yourself. <coughs> Isaiah 9, 7. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. You know the context of this, right? It's the promise of the coming of the Messiah. A child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. The government will rest on his shoulder. This is Isaiah prophesying the coming of Jesus. And it says, he will sit on the throne of David from then on and forevermore. Then what about Jeremiah 33? Let's take a minute and read that. Jeremiah 33 verse 14, and quite a few verses following. 40, uh, 14 in chapter 33, are you there? Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth and he shall execute just, justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days Judah shall be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell in safety, and this is the name by which she shall be called. The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priest shall never lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to burn grain offerings and to prepare sacrifices continually. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and with the Levitical priests, my ministers. 
as the host of heaven cannot be counted and the sand of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Have you not observed what this people have spoken? Saying, The two families which the Lord chose, he has rejected them, Thus they despise my people no longer. Are they as a nation in their sight? Thus says the Lord, If my covenant for day and night stand not, and the fixed patterns of heaven and earth I have not established, then I would reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, not taking from his descendants ruler over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy on them. God's covenants never fail. He is keeping covenant through the ages, through the generations, even when it doesn't look like he is. See, we have to look at God's covenant the way he looks at things, not how we look at things. His ways are higher than our ways. <laughs> is the sun still there? Is the moon still there? Are the stars still there? Is there still sand on the beach? Then his covenant stands firm. Even though we do not see the throne of David occupied, I can, you can go into the city of David and you can see that they are uncovering the palace of David. They are uncovering where his throne may have been in the palace. But there's no king of David, the son of David sitting on it yet, is there? So that must mean no one's on the throne of David. Ah, but God says, if the sun's still there and the moon's still there, I will fulfill this promise. It has simply been interrupted. Now let's go over to um, <coughs> Psalm 89. One more, just because if I haven't got you convinced by now, I want you to see what the scripture says about how God views his covenants. He is a covenant-keeping God. Psalm 89, verses 3 and 4. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. Then look at verses 34. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His descendant shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, and the witness in the sky is faithful. God's promises, friends, cannot fail. They can take time. They can be interrupted. It may even mean that we need to be corrected in the middle of that promise being fulfilled. But if the moon and the stars are still there, God will fulfill his word. <laughs> when, when will he fulfill it? That's our big question, right? As we've waited and waited. You know, it's funny about God. It's like nothing, 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 nothing. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Then suddenly, suddenly, things begin to happen. You know, after these prophets wrote, after Isaiah and Jeremiah and um, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Micah, Zechariah, there were 400 years of silence in Israel. No more prophets. No more man anointed to speak to the people for God. Only the good old scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees. <laughs> And suddenly, an angel appears to Zacharias and says, Zacharias, your wife Elizabeth will bear a son in her old age. Suddenly, an angel appears to Mary and says, you will bear the seed of God Most High. You will bear the Son of God. Suddenly, Elizabeth and John the Baptist are filled with the Holy Spirit. Zacharias is filled with the Holy Spirit. All of these Suddenly, after 400 years of silence. 
then after Jesus is born, the fulfillment, a child will be born, a son will be given to us. In Luke 2, verse 1, Caesar Augustus decrees a census of all the known world. This is God's clock beginning. All these prophecies, all these covenants, all the prophets, nothing, nothing, nothing for 400 years. Then suddenly God's clock begins again toward the fulfillment of these covenants. Something set in motion. Caesar Augustus was used of God to fulfill prophecy because some of the prophecies said he would come from Bethlehem. Other prophecies said he would come from Nazareth. Others said he would come from Egypt. You can't understand. How can a person come from three places? But he did. He was born in Bethlehem. They had to flee to Egypt. Then he was raised in Nazareth. You can only see that in looking backwards, can't you? Looking forward, you say, how can this possibly come true? <laughs> how can a person come from three different places? <clears throat> but in retrospect, we can see that God's word was fulfilled perfectly. And God's time clock started again with the birth of Jesus. Suddenly can be messy, okay? We have this covenant with David. I'm going to bring forth a descendant of yours that will take up your throne. When you sin or get off, get off course, I will, I will correct you with the rods of men. Terrible things happen. They had to go into exile in Babylon. Just so many things happened to the Jewish people. It's only by God's hand that they even survived. But then when the prophecy began, when God's clock started again with Jesus, here we have a baby out of wedlock. No one understands this family. How is this little girl, 14, 15 years old, suddenly pregnant? We have her riding a donkey to Egypt, or to, to Bethlehem with her betrothed. And smelly shepherds out in the field are the only ones who receive the news <laughs> from the angels. Then they have to flee as refugees for their lives to Egypt because Rome wants to put all the babies to death. Prophecy, fulfillment of God's word, of his covenant, can be messy. And we are living in these kinds of times. We have to look at the context for our lives. You know, we need to find ourselves in the context of what God is doing. So let me just give you a quick history lesson in here and then we're going to continue we want to apply this to us and how God is fulfilling his covenant and what that means personally to us okay all right so as we said David was God's appointed king over the nation of Israel and these were certainly the glory days of Israel these were the days when Israel prospered and thrived and they were a sovereign nation and they defeated their enemies all around if there was ever a time you wanted to be an Israelite, if there was ever a time you wanted to be a Hebrew, this was the time. This was the glory days of Israel under David's rulership, um, leadership. <coughs> then Solomon, David's son, he built the glorious temple. And kings and queens from all over came to see this wonder of the world. So Israel was the happening place to be, the glory days of Israel. But then, as we know, Solomon married many, many <laughs> foreign wives, and he began to worship their gods, began to put idols up. Um, I told you where the Kidron Valley is here behind me, and then the Mount of Olives was covered with the idols of his foreign wives. And things began to fall apart quickly because as soon as Solomon died, the nation divided. The ten northern tribes were called Israel. And they had 19 kings, every one of them wicked. Every one. And in 722 BC, the 10 northern tribes were exiled into Assyria. The two southern tribes were called Judah. Also, Judah had 19 kings. 11 of them were righteous. Um, sorry, got that backwards. Eight of them were righteous, 11 of them were wicked. So kings were always coming into line after a wicked king, then they'd make reforms, and they'd reestablish the feasts, and they'd take down the high places. Then the next king would come in, and he would put up the idols again. And they were just constantly having this back and forth of restoring and then just wrecking everything again. <coughs> but in 586 BC, Judah 
was exiled into Babylon. Why? Because God said, I will use the rods of men to correct you. God will use even our enemies to bring us back to himself. God will use our enemies to teach us his ways and say, you want foreign gods all the time? Go try living under them for 70 years and see if you like it. Maybe you want to come back under my blessing after you live under the hand of foreign gods for 70 years. <coughs> his judgment is his mercy. He loves us too much to let us go on and on that way. So he brings us back to himself through these kinds of judgments, these corrections. So the last divinely pointed, appointed king of the house and lineage of David was Zedekiah. And he lived during the time of Jeremiah and, David, and Daniel. In 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar killed Zedekiah's two sons in front of him, then had his eyes put out. So much for kings over Israel. No more kings of Israel, of the tribe of Judah, of the house and lineage of David. Here, it would seem that the throne of David ends, wouldn't it? Because from then on, only Gentile kings and Gentile rulers ruled over Israel. So Zedekiah's death ushered in what Jesus called the times of the Gentiles. Have you heard that term before? The times of the Gentiles. It's found in Luke 21, 24. Let's go ahead and turn over to that so you can notice that in case you haven't before. Luke 21, <coughs> 24. And they will fall, this is Jesus speaking, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So let me just give you a simple definition of the times of the Gentiles. <clears throat> the times of the Gentiles equals the centuries when there is no divinely appointed Jewish king of the tribe of Judah and of the house of David ruling over Israel. Let me say that again. The times of the Gentiles is the centuries when there is no divinely appointed Jewish king of the tribe of Judah and of the house of David ruling over Israel. The times of the Gentiles began in 586 B.C. with Zedekiah being killed and have lasted now for over 2,600 years, from 586 B.C. until the present year. Give you a quick rundown of the different Gentiles who have ruled over Israel. First came Babylon. <coughs> then came Medo-Persia. Then Greece. Then Rome. Then the Byzantines. Then in 637, the Muslims. Then in 1099, the Crusaders. Then 1517, the Ottoman Turks for 400 years. Then in 1917, the British Mandate. After World War I, the Great Britain was given the mandate to establish a national homeland for the Jews in the land which was called Palestine. Then 1948, Jordan still ruled over Jerusalem, even though many Jews had come back to Israel. And then, in 1948, the secular state of Israel was established. It was given statehood. It was a recognized nation. But there was no king. It's still a secular state, right? The times of the Gentiles began in 586 and have lasted now for over 2,600 years from 586 B.C. until the present. So what has happened to the dynasty, the covenant that God made with David? It has been interrupted. God's ways are not our ways. We would say if something's been erupted, interrupted for this long, surely it's over. But God's timing isn't our timing. 
Jews came back into their land. They trickled back since the 1800s, the early 1900s. But on May 14, 1948, they established themselves as a nation, recognized by our president, Harry Truman. And since that time, they have had prime ministers. They've had Ben-Gurion. They've had Golda Meir. They've had Yitzhak Rabin, Ariel Sharon, Benjamin Netanyahu, and many others. But these leaders are humanly appointed. They are voted for in general elections. They are not divinely appointed, not of the tribe of Judah necessarily, not of divinic lineage. The throne of David has not yet been reestablished. And most of Israel today has given up. (laughs) They just say, you know, we just want to be a nation like every other nation. We just want a good prime minister. They are not waiting and looking, at least they don't know that they're waiting, for the king the king that will rule forever from the throne of David. But the fact is, Israel is waiting for the throne to be once again taken up by the king who is of the tribe of Judah, the house and lineage of David, the righteous, divinely appointed king. Not only Israel, but I submit to you that all of creation is waiting for that day. All of creation is longing and groaning for that day, waiting, waiting, waiting for a suddenly, for a promise made to David 3,000 years ago. Let's turn over to Romans. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Like I said, we'll just take our time. I know we've got a lot of scripture here, but it's really important for us to understand these things. This is Paul writing. I'm in verse 18. (coughs) For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Yes, we have the first fruits. We have salvation through Jesus Christ, but there's still more we're waiting for because we are living in a corrupt fallen world that is not being ruled by its rightful king. So yes, we have the glorious salvation right now and all the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, but we are still waiting for more, aren't we? We, If we aren't, there's something wrong with us. If we're content with how things are, this scripture clearly says we are eagerly waiting and groaning like a woman in childbirth saying, let's get this over. (laughs) Let's bring forth this child. Verse 19, let's unpack this a little bit. Verse 19 says, the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Sons is a very important word here. In Greek, the word is huios, H-U-I-O-S, huios. Huios is not a child or an infant, but it's a grown-up one. It's, it's like when your children grow up and you're just so impressed with the, with the man or the woman they have become. They are mature offspring that reflect the character of everything that's been poured into them, and you just say, I'm so proud, son, that you've got grown into a wonderful young man. Sons of God are not children. They are 
complete. They have been restored to the fullness of what God had in mind when he created us. But he didn't create us to be sinners. He didn't create us to be fallen and full of weaknesses and flesh and fallibles. He created us to be awesome. <laughs> he created us to be able to rule with him like Adam was ruling over planet Earth. He created us to be intelligent and creative and awesome. And we, we don't even know how far we've fallen from that which he wanted us to be in the first place. John 1.12 says, As many as received him, they're, they're given the right to become children of God. Then later, Jesus said, No longer do I call you slaves, but I call you friends. So that's a step up. <laughs> but his ultimate purpose is to make us sons, to return us to who we were supposed to be in the first place. When will we see the sons of God revealed? When will we see ourselves as God truly created us to be? It's when Jesus visits upon the throne of David, takes back dominion over the earth from Satan, and restores humanity to the fullness of what Adam was in the garden. Do you ever feel that longing? Do you ever feel this yearning? Like, life, is this all there is to it? <laughs> I work so hard, I try so hard, and is this as far as I can get? Do you ever feel just kind of a void, an emptiness? All of creation, and that includes us as his creation, whether we know it or not, is yearning. The question is, what are you doing with that yearning? Are you, are you trying to fill it with everything you can find to fill it with? whether it be drugs or alcohol or food or relationships or ministry work. <laughs> you know, even good things can be things we are just trying to fill a void with. We are supposed to be yearning, friends. You are supposed to feel that yearning. It doesn't mean something's wrong. It means something's right. All of creation means you and me. That we are groaning. We are suffering for something more than just temporal happiness of getting an education, finding a spouse, having a few children, and having a nice retirement. We are yearning for something more. All the personal temporal happiness in the world will never fulfill this. Because in your knower, you know. <laughs> your knower is down here. In your guts, you know that there is a disturbance in the force, and only one thing will fix it. You know, constantly every president that comes into office tries to broker a Mideast peace deal, right? So they've got these two state solutions going on, and every president thinks, I'm going to be the one who makes peace in the Middle East, and we'll work out the Palestinian-Israeli problem. We'll, we'll create a two-state solution. But this is not a way to peace in the Middle East. It's a roadmap straight to war. It is Gentile rulers exerting their plans for Israel. All of the events in the Middle East today are working together to bring things to a climax, to fulfill what the prophets said would happen. The stage is being set. The players are taking their cues for the last act of human history. Just like with Caesar Augustus, it was a political movement to take Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. That indicates God's clock being activated. So as we watch these events happening in our world, you have to know there's something behind it. God's on a clock to fulfill what he promised to David and to the prophets. And Israel is waiting for that throne of, the, of, the, of David to be taken up again by the king who is of the tribe of Judah, the house and lineage of David. God's covenant with David is everlasting. It's simply interrupted by the times of the Gentiles. The big question is, does Jesus himself hold credentials to take up that throne? If we're going to put a, a king on the throne of David, we need to make sure he's not a false Christ because that will also come along to, um, to confuse many and deceive many. So we've got to make sure that the king who declares himself king and tries to take up that throne has the right credentials. He warned us, don't go after false Christ. Don't follow an antichrist 
Anti means against, but it also means in place of. So the Antichrist will present himself as having the credentials. So let's look at Jesus. Does he have the credentials? Well, he is of the tribe of Judah. <laughs> Revelation, Revelation 5, verse 5. I began, I'm going to start with four, and I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. Just a, a thumbnail sketch here. This book, this scroll, is like the deed to planet Earth. The one who's going to be able to take the deed to planet Earth out of Satan's hands and redeem what has fallen into Satan's hands. So John is weeping, saying, who could ever do this? Who could buy back the deed from Satan to creation. <clears throat> Verse 5, And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. <laughs> Jesus is of the tribe of Judah. Do you realize that Jesus has never given up his Jewish identity? Even though he has ascended to heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father, he still identifies himself as of the tribe of Judah. He has a Jewish background, a Jewish lineage. Jesus' ancestry goes back to David on both Joseph and Mary's side. And that was documented in the temple records. Well, the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D., only those born before that date could prove that they were descended of David. Anyone born after 70 AD could not prove they had the credentials of being of the house and lineage of David. So that helps us narrow down who has the credentials, doesn't it? <coughs> Still in Revelation, let's turn over to chapter 22. And we're getting down to my last page of notes here, so... The end is in sight, 22, 1, and th 1 through 3. And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall no, shall no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his bond servants shall serve him. Then over to verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Jesus, in his millennial reign, will fulfill the covenant of David given in 2 Samuel 7, 3,000 years ago. Oh, I love reading these verses because, as I've told you many times, you read the Bible like this. <laughs> what God meant at the very beginning goes all the way around and ends in Revelation 22. God restores us back to what he had in mind in the first place, and we are yearning and groaning and longing for that to happen. Okay, three more, three more um, references here. <coughs> Zechariah, if you don't know how to find Zechariah, go to Matthew. Then go back to the Italian prophet Malachi, and then you have Zechariah. Zechariah 12. Very important book, Zechariah, if we want to understand what's going to happen in these last days of travail before God brings all this to pass. <coughs> Zechariah 12, 2. Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. And it will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will be severely injured. 
and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. Verse 8, In that day the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the one who is feeble among them in that day will be like David, and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. And it will come about in that day that I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so they will look upon me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Oh, how those verses cause me to have such emotions when Jesus is reconciled to his Jewish brethren and they finally receive him as their Messiah and the answer to everything they've been desperately looking for. The Jewish people are so resilient, you know. If you look at a list of Nobel Peace Prizes or Nobel Prizes in every category, science, technology, the Jewish people make up this much of the Earth's population and the Nobel Prize lists that have gone to them is longer than any other people group. They are resilient. They are brilliant. They are incredible people. But they have been lost. They have been separated for all these years. They crucified their own king, which he died for all of us. But they did not recognize he was their Messiah to the Jew first and then the Greek. And ever since then, they've been searching in every possible way and now Jesus is going to be reconciled to his biological brethren, and they will look upon him who they pierced, and they will know he is their king. Jesus is longing for this day, and the Jewish people are longing for this day, whether they know it or not. Amen? Then um, Zechariah 14, verse 4, And on that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. Verse 8, And it will come about in that day that living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, the other half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And the Lord will will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. (coughs) We are living in the most amazing times ever. We are living in the days when the throne of David is about to be reestablished. The conflict will be enormous, but what a day to live to see prophecy and covenant fulfillment right before our eyes. You say, oh, I wish I could have lived in biblical times. Uh You are. (laughs) You are. Psalm 122. I'm headed toward the finish line here. Psalm 122. Verse 6. Pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Friends, peace will never come to Jerusalem until Jesus is established as king of kings there on David's throne. Do you believe that? If you believe what the Bible says, then you need to believe that. Then and only then, peace will come to Israel, to the Middle East, and it will flow out to all the world. And according to Romans 8, all of creation is longing for this. You are longing for this, whether you know it or not. The yearning gets stronger. (laughs) The waiting gets harder. The longer we wait and just see the world falling apart, the waiting gets harder. But then there's going to be a suddenly. (laughs) We need to have that expectation in our hearts. God is behind it all. While he cares very much about your daily needs 
and my daily needs, and he's involved in the little things. He's involved in our daily cares and concerns and our children and our grandchildren. He is. He's, he's involved in the desires of our hearts for our lives. But there's also something much bigger he is doing to bring more happiness than any temporal blessing we could ever ask or hope. So knowing this, my friend, knowing this gives you a sense of identity that you are a son and you have not, and this is gender inclusive, okay? This is women because son means grown up one. You're not just a child of the king. A child of the king still has to be put to bed by nannies. (laughs) A son of the king reflects his father and executes his business and um, communes with his father about important things. And this is a son, a woman or a man is a son. And that gives you a sense of identity of this is who God created me to be. That's why all this is going on. So he can restore creation and restore you and me to that identity. So we know what it says in Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God. You can say it with me. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Does this mean you get more religious and you go to church more and you read your Bible? (laughs) Of course, those are good things. But put your life in perspective. There's a reason you're feeling the things you feel. There's something you're holding on for that you just don't quite know how to grasp it. Something that's going to make all this worth it. Hang on. God's clock is ticking. His promises will be fulfilled. I don't know how to close this except for maybe to pray the Lord's Prayer with an emphasis on thy kingdom come because that's what we're yearning for. Amen? Let's pray that together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining me on these In the Footsteps of Jesus teachings. I hope that you've been blessed by them and you might share them with your friends. Shalom, y'all. Shalom, y'all. Stella.